Huh? Huh? Hmm? Huh. So, hello everyone and welcome back to Sticky History. This video is fairly overdue as a result of a year-long hiatus on my part, but I am back due to popular demand. Thank you for bearing with me and hopefully I'll be able to make more videos in the future. On to the video. I'm hoping this video may turn into something of a mini-series following on from my Peter the Great and Winston Churchill video. Because when I first started this channel, I hoped to help some A-level students who are procrastinating on YouTube as I was in 2019. So today, we're going to talk about David Lloyd George, a prominent figure in the wars and welfare Britain in transition 1906 to 1957 AQA course. Of course, this is not exclusively for students, but for anyone who is searching for their daily nugget of knowledge. David Lloyd George was born in Chorlton on Medlock, Manchester, on the 17th of January 1863 to Welsh parents, though he was largely raised by his mother and uncle as a result of his father's death just a year after his birth. Throughout his upbringing, he studied the works of many socialist and liberal writers, such as Sidney and Beatrice Webb. Bernard Shaw and Henry George. Ultimately, this influence during adolescence helped to mould his later political career. He also became a successful solicitor after he left education. Lloyd George stepped into his first major political role in Carnarvon, Wales as MP in 1890. However, as this job was unpaid at the time, Lloyd George was forced to continue in his role as a solicitor whilst representing his constituents at Westminster. He was a self-proclaimed Welsh nationalist and proponent of Welsh Home Rule. He played a part in the foundation of the National Library and National Museum of Wales, as well as offering his support for a university in Wales. As a member of the Liberal Party, Lloyd George had strong views on social reform and legislation. The 1900 survey by Charles Booth and Sabone Roundtree drove the Liberal social welfare reforms, which Lloyd George was a part of, as he, re he was recognised in 1906 with his appointment to the Board of Trade and later in the capacity of Chancellor of the Exchequer under the Herbert Asquith administration. This appointment reflects the Liberals' move towards the movement of new liberalism, which included a greater emphasis on social wellbeing and governmental aid and reform in society. The first significant reform promoted and steered by Lloyd George was the 1909 People's Budget. This, the main message of this legislation was to tax the rich to help the poor and vulnerable, which came in a variety of different forms. An inheritance tax was introduced, a land tax, a car tax, and a tax based on personal wealth above a certain threshold. Although this was popular in the Liberal-dominated House of Commons, the consequent backlash faced from the Conservative-dominated House of Lords resulted in the Lords' power and influence being significantly reduced after a constitutional crisis. During his time as Chancellor, Lloyd George also helped to put measures in place to help the ill and elderly, as well as introducing the National Insurance Act of 1911, which covered a large proportion of the working population. This work was done in close collaboration with another leading Liberal at the time, Winston Churchill. Lloyd George was also instrumental in disestablishing the church in Wales and taking away the rights of its bishops. During World War I, Lloyd George increased the country's debt in order to pay for the war in his role as Chancellor. In the wartime coalition, he took up the position of Minister of Munitions in 1915, a job that would oversee the supply of ammunition to the army and mobilisation of the workforce after the Shell Crisis of 1915. As a powerful and convincing orator, Lloyd George excelled in his new position and was able to put effectively motivate those working on the production line, leading to increased munitions output. He later supported conscription to the British Army to satisfy the need of manpower during the war, especially in the later stages. In 1916, Lloyd George was awarded the position of Secretary of State to succeed Lord Kitchener. This cabinet was poorly organised and Lloyd George was far from happy with the way in which Asquith was running the country. He was not alone in these thoughts, as many of the Conservatives who had joined the coalition no longer supported or trusted Asquith to continue in the job as Prime Minister. Lloyd George proposed the formation of a smaller cabinet, 
as opposed to one of 23 under Asquith to aid in making quicker decisions in high pressure situations. The Conservatives liked the new idea of how Lloyd George proposed to run the government, so agreed to back him as Prime Minister. This support was crucial for Lloyd George, as many Liberals still backed Asquith and refused to work under this new government. The situation came to a front in December 1916, when Lloyd George and other Conservative cabinet members resigned in protest of Asquith's insistence that he lead the new war committee. This withdrawal of support forced Asquith to step down, leaving a vacancy in number 10 Downing Street. Lloyd George was then invited to form a government by the King after Andrew Bonalore refused the Premiership, which was dominated by Conservative figures. As you can imagine, this greatly angered the Liberals, who agreed to support the wartime coalition, but reported to Herbert Asquith as the leader of their party. So as you can see, Lloyd George's position as Prime Minister was tenuous at best. He now relied on a party he had once hated, he especially relied on Bonalore, who acted as an intermediary between the Conservatives and Lloyd George. This worked well during wartime, and well, we know how the war turned out for Britain in the end. However, for Lloyd George as an individual, his future was slightly less certain. The rift between Lloyd George and the Liberals, more specifically Asquith, had certainly not healed during this time. So he was forced to continue relying on the support of the Conservatives to continue in his role as Prime Minister. So the 1918 election was fought between Asquith's Liberals and the Conservative government, headed by Lloyd George, who had been successful during wartime and had ultimately won the war for Britain. Those who sided with the Conservatives were given a coupon from Lloyd George and Bonalore in recognition of their support, hence it was coined the coupon election of 1918. This was also a significant election as it marked the first time women were allowed to vote thanks to the 1918 Representation of the People Act. In a brief summary, Lloyd George's campaign was aimed at punishing Germany and big players in the German regime, including Kaiser Wilhelm II, a more isolationist policy of keeping British produce and output in Britain and creating a happier society for all. It's fair to say that the election was a bit of a landslide, with the Conservatives winning 344 seats, meaning that Lloyd George had received the mandate from the people he needed to continue in his role as Prime Minister. To add insult to injury, Asquith also lost his seat in East Fife. In the post-war years, Lloyd George's government introduced a plethora of reforms, including the 1918 Education Act, which increased teachers' salaries and upped the school leaving age to 14, the House and Housing and Town Planning Act of 1919, aimed to stimulate house building until 1922, the Unemployment Act of 1920, extended the reaches of unemployment, which fixed prices and wages in the farming market to help agricultural workers, not to mention the foundation of the Ministry of Health, which increased the accessibility of health care. As good as this may sound, Lloyd George was not without his enemies and he encountered lots of difficulties during his term as Prime Minister from 1918 to 22. The Treaty of Versailles and post-war settlements were played with disagreements which tarnished Lloyd George's reputation at home. Many thought the treaty was too harsh on Germany, whilst others didn't think it went far enough to punish the aggressors. The country also entered a time of steep economic depression which made worse by industrial action and union strikes and problems in Ireland, where the tension had simmered during the war but threatened to boil over in the years following 1918. This bleak situation was worsened by the 1922 Chinook crisis which saw Lloyd George sending troops into Greece to prevent Turkish forces from seizing Chinook. And the final nail in the coffin came when it became common knowledge that Lloyd George had been selling peerages and knighthoods in order to fund his own political party. Considering in 1909 he had been so staunchly against the House of Lords and there was even a constitutional crisis in which the power of the Lords had been severely curtailed, greatly down to his influence, this came as a big surprise for people. With Andrew Bonalore now in pretty poor health, um, it came for the time for the Conservatives to find a new Prime Minister. The 1922 meeting at the Carlton Club showed that Lloyd George had really lost all support from the Conservatives, including Bonalore, and consequently was forced to resign. The 1922 election marked the decline of the Liberals, who had once been a huge power and when they were now winning less seats than the relatively young Labour Party. So, thank you very much for watching Sticky History. If you have any suggestions for any new videos, 
let me know in the comments and don't forget to like and subscribe and then I will see you all in a year <laughs>